What's up, everybody, and welcome to episode 95 of Snakes and a Fat Man. Chris, if you can, please read this with sincerity. I'll try, John. <laughs> so the other day I told John, you know what would be really cool is if you did some video interviews with actual big breeders and had conversations about the platform. Of course, they wouldn't be as good as all of this. Okay, all of that, all of this. You know, what are you going to do? But it would still be fucking badass because everything Morph Market does is badass. And so, like, John always does what I tell him, right? So he did it. It's called Morph Market in Action. M-M-I-A. Real acronym for you there. Mamma Mia. Mamma Mia. Mamma Mia. Yeah, no, that's a... Small I, big A, okay? <laughs> in this new video series, Morph Market in action, founder John Lehman interviews top breeders, including Ozzy Boyds, Mark Mandick, Tom Harbin, Gavin Atkins, and more. They cover topics such as how to set up the animal manager with your breeders, creating breeding plans, pricing animals, new features like waitlisting, and other breeding tips. That's what you go for. You go for the other, okay? That's all I'm saying, okay? Learn how these top breeders have used Morph Market to make their businesses more successful. Head on over to Morph Market's YouTube channel and you'll find several episodes already available. See, that's how it's done. You launch something with episodes already available, so you have a fucking pipeline. Go, John, right? Subscribe so you don't miss any future shows. And make sure to visit Morph Market at Tinley Park to hang out, discuss the site, and pick up a limited edition Tinley Park t-shirt. All right, what we're gonna do now is head on down south and see what Herps has going on. See, little fucking Axel Otto. I, I, I guess that's cool. Uh, cool.
Okay. They're going to be in Bryan College Station on March 11th and 12th. They're going to be in Waco, Texas, March 25th and 26th. They're going to be in Slidell, Louisiana, April 1st and 2nd. They're going to be back in Austin, Texas on April 22nd and 23rd. They're going to be in Pearland, Texas on March 6th and 7th. Fuck you, James. Uh, they're going to be back in Lake Charles, Louisiana on June 3rd and 4th. And the big show in Conroe, Texas on June 10th and 11th. I'm going to do my best to get down to that one because uh, I'd really like to see my fucking Texas people again. Then look at that. Wait, did I say the date? They're going to be in Conroe June 10th and 11th. And they're going to be back in Shreveport. That's how Theo Vaughn says it. Louisiana on June 24th and 25th. Listen, head on over to herpshow.net to get all the latest news and dates. And uh, go check out the uh, Tipsy Trinket. I believe they just opened up their brand new karaoke room. So if you're in uh, Bryan, College Station that is, uh, go to Tipsy Trinket. I, I'm pretty sure that that's the city it's in. And uh, go fucking uh, badly sing some songs. All right, guys, herpshow.net. What's up, guys? We have a busy show today. Uh, we're going to be announcing the winner of the Stop Looking and Sounding Like Shit giveaway. We have Troy Woodruff from Balls and Strikes on 15 Minutes of Lame. And then we have our main guest, Spencer Tedesco from A Tree Frog Collective. It's very exciting. All right. I don't know what else to tell you. It's just very, very exciting. But uh, before we do that, I've been reading and watching some shit on the interweb this week about the hatred by some of, uh, of the old fat man here. And don't worry, I'm not going to vent or argue or call anybody out specifically. However, I thought it would be fun to compile a list of the top five reasons that people hate Chris Eaton. Kind of like a uh, celebrities read mean tweets about themselves. Not saying that I'm a snake celebrity, but I guess technically I, I, guess technically I am a, a reptile celebrity. Uh, if I could find the eye roll emoji, I'm going to put that here right now. And I thought to myself, maybe if I did this with the intention of making it funny, uh, I could take a long, hard look at myself and see if, uh, if, if it would make me change. No, no, I'm always fucking around with you. No, I'm not going to change. Fuck all these people, right? I'm literally just too old and too fucking tired to fucking fight for people that are never going to be fans of mine anyway. So fuck them. So without further ado, here are the top five reasons people hate Chris Eaton. Number five, he says offensive shit that triggers me. Well, pussy, then don't watch. There's 25 other reptile shows out there that are safe spaces and they won't hurt your feelings. I personally don't have time or an inclination to worry about whether your Repticon level animals are ever going to make you any fucking money. Go listen to one of those other 25 podcasts that will tell you exactly what you want to hear. And as far as the jokes go, listen, they're just fucking jokes. If you can't handle a joke, and a joke triggers your fucking feelings, then go fuck yourself anyway. Number four, he's old. Yeah, that, that's, that's true. I, I, I can't really do anything about that. 49, okay? However, I do find it funny when other people who are almost 40 are calling me old. What the fuck is that shit about? Especially people that have been in the hobby for under five years and rant and rave all day like fucking children and dance around like fucking idiots on camera. I wouldn't do that shit when I was fucking 19. I'm sure as fuck not doing it now. So yeah, if calling me old distances me from that fucking shithead crowd, then fucking sign me up, call me old. Number three, he shits on the ball python people and hates the hobby. Well, idiots. Do you think that I would be doing this fucking goddamn show for seven fucking years 
if I hated the hobby? Do you think that I would have the sponsors that I have on this show if I hated the hobby? Sponsors who have literally never dropped me after seven years, by the way. Do you think I would have the guests that I have on and the most popular new breeder segment in the hobby if I hated the ball python community? I hate some of the ball python community. Luckily, most of you already know who you are. Number two, hot girls with big boobs. Yeah, gotta admit, I love showing off hot girls with big boobs in my t-shirts. And you know what? 99% of the guys in the hobby love it. Hell, I think probably 60% of the women in the hobby fucking love it. Oh, how it must suck to see all these beautiful women with big boobs in my t-shirts on my post. I'm sorry. I apologize from the bottom of my heart. I apologize that hot women with big boobs triggers you. And um, yeah, I'm not, not going to stop. going to keep doing it. Sorry. I don't know what to tell you. And the number one reason people hate Chris Eaton, he doesn't keep any reptiles. This one drives motherfuckers nuts, especially other podcast hosts. And it's true. I don't keep any reptiles now. I got two little fat bastard frogs over there, but they're not reptiles. So yes, I keep zero reptiles. And other podcast hosts and some other reptile people are like, listen, how does Chris have this huge following in the reptile community, yet he doesn't keep any reptiles? I don't understand it. I, that, that, that is a conundrum. Well, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I'm going to tell you why. It's because I am likable as fuck, and you guys are not. The fuck is haters because they ain't us. They hate us because we ain't us? What the fuck does an ain't us have to do with they this? They hate us because they ain't ain't us that's not what it is yes it is no it's not they hate us because we is us and what we is doing is fucking terrible they fucking hate us because they stop ain't us. saying that hate us because they ain't us they don't hate us because they, they ain't us they don't hate us i'm they used ain't to us. it they hate us because they, they ain't us stop it don't say it again all right listen here again if you don't use rep to chip then fuck you man fuck you in your fucking ass rep to chip is the best cocoa substrate on the fucking planet and it's veteran owned who doesn't want to buy from a veteran owned fucking company that's all i'm saying don't be a fucking rep to communist use rep to chip head on over to rep to chip.com and go get a bag or a brick or a bigger bag or even a smaller bag i, I don't i don't fucking care what you buy just get on it Redline Shipping is the number one service for all your live reptile, aquatic, and invertebrate shipping needs. Email Robin with a Y at redlineshipping.com to get your own custom discount to save you money over any of the competitors. Since we're in winter, live shipping is less frequent due to the cold temperatures, but you could ship your merchandise and dry goods year round with Redline Shipping. Merchandise can be shipped with overnight, two-day, three-day, and ground services. The, uh, the winner of the, uh, the old contest is going to get their uh, stuff delivered to them via Redline. That's all I'm saying, okay? If you follow the Redline guidelines for temperature and heat pack use, you could ship live animals throughout the winter and still make use of Redline shipping on time and live arrival insurance. RedlineShipping.com has the best website and interface in the industry, including features and functions that no other service offers. The site is fast, smooth, and easy to use. Use the old uh, code here, FATMAN5, for an extra $5 off your already discounted rates. I wonder if the FATMAN5 code can be used by the actual FATMAN. Let's find out. Listen, Redline Shipping is the spot. It's the place to be. Join Team Redline and be better off red. All right, so I've been accused in the past of running contests for too long. Uh, the only reason I do that is so that everybody who wants to enter has a chance to enter. But the next contest will probably be a little bit shorter uh, than this one. We are going to announce the winner of the Stop Looking and Sounding Like Shit giveaway right now but i have to uh roll on over to the other computer here because i want to have the little gay wheel on the screen 
so that I could show you and be transparent when the random winner is picked. Let's uh, let's head on over there and pick a fucking winner. All right, guys, I'm here at the other computer because I wanted to uh, be as transparent as I can before I spin the wheel. And uh, just to let everybody know, I will contact the winner after this episode and get their address and everything. And I will ship out the Brio uh, 4K camera, the Blue Yeti microphone, and the Tascam headphones to you using Redline shipping. And uh, I'm going to do that probably uh, probably this week at some point, M maybe Monday. But e either way, I'll let you know when we'll be in contact. So what I'm going to do is these are all the people here that entered. Okay, so uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to shuffle up the wheel just so nobody could, conf you know, uh, uh, accuse me of uh, playing favorites here. Okay, so there we go. It's all shuffled. Now we are going to spin the wheel. Boom. Aaron Klein from Better Up Balls. Congratulations, Aaron. Hope you fucking like the stuff. Hope you look great and sound great on any future podcast that you do. I appreciate everybody that entered, and uh, we're going to do another contest soon in a collaboration with Michael Stefani of Mike's Monitors. So uh, we, we got to figure everything out, but we're going to have the next one probably in a month or so. But again, congratulations to Aaron Klein from Better Up Balls. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that name, but, y you know, it's, it's, it's not horrible, but uh, whatever. Aaron, congratulations. Uh, I'll get the stuff out to you in the next couple of days. Say goodbye to spreadsheets. Say hello to Clutch. Hello, Clutch. This brand, that's a Honeymooners reference just for all you fucking young people that, uh, that don't get it. Go back and watch the fucking Honeymooners. This brand new cloud-based software makes managing your ball python collection simple. With Clutch, you can easily create, search, and filter your collection, visualize your projects with analytics and insights, keep track of past, present, and future clutches, and connect every customer with the perfect animal using their insanely great waitlist system. It's already live. Head on over to fucking clutch.io and learn more and get ready to discover the power of your collection. That's C L T C H dot I O. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, Snakes in the Batman proudly brings to you its new breeder segment 15 minutes of life. Hey guys, it's Justin at Canova. So in the past few years, Canova's become the top source for amazing ball pythons. Now Chris tells me, Justin, it's time to give back. So we're sponsoring the 15 minutes of Lane to support the new and upcoming breeders. So jump in here. Let's hear your ideas. Let's hear your thoughts. Maybe you can turn your 15 minutes of Lane into 20 years of Lane, just like I did. If you want to be the man, you got to beat the man. Woo! So bring it. 15 minutes of Lane! What's up, everybody? Look who I have here. I have fucking Troy Woodruff from Balls and Strikes Pythons. What's going on, brother? Oh, just the usual. Just been cleaning rodent racks today. Oh, gross already. We're starting the interview on something gross. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, you know how this works, all right? I do. Um, we're going to give you 15 on the clock, and that's going to start now. Uh, first off, right off the bat, what, what's with the name? I kind of like the name and I kind of like the logo. So the name actually, you know, when I first started up, I was trying to come up with something clever or whatever, and I really couldn't come up with anything. I was a little league baseball coach at the time. 
And I was always kind of on my players about balls and strikes and wins and losses and balls and strikes. And finally, one day, a couple of the kids on my team, including my son, were like, why don't you call your business that balls and strikes, you know, ball pythons and strikes are what they do when they bike. Just, and I was like, wow, that just makes sense. Oh, I, I would have referred at constantly striking out at the odds, but okay, that that's okay. cool too. But, yeah, yeah, that's how it came about. And then the logo, oh, that no, nope, that's that way. So the logo, my wife drew all the logos. She's done all the designs for the shirts and the logos. And people before we had the pinup girl on there would ask if it was like something to do with bowling because of the, I guess, the font in the logo. Right. But since it came from baseball. Um, we, uh, my, my wife loosely based the little pinup girl there on our, uh, our daughter. So she's done some modeling and stuff. So, so that's, that is loosely based on our daughter. The oh, Jesus. <laughs> Fuck. I was going to yeah. say, I'm a big fan <laughs> of the pinup girl, but now how old's your daughter? Oh no, she's, she's 21. Oh, all right. All right. Oh no. Yeah. She's, yeah, Jesus she's, Christ. <laughs> she's my stepdaughter, my <laughs> wife, you know, but. Yeah. Oh no, she's she's a beautiful young lady. She's done some modeling work from the for the place she works at, and uh, and so my wife, you know, loosely based that on on her on Maddie. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. well, I definitely give you a solid eight on the name. The name is cool. I think. Awesome. Thank you. Um, now you're in South Carolina, right? Yes, just outside of Columbia. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Why should people buy from you when they have people like 15 Minutes of Lame Winners, Leviathan Snakes down there? Why well, should they buy from Balls and Strikes? Well, first of all, Leviathan's one of my customers as well. So, and I've done a few projects with them. But why buy from me? I actually knew you're going to ask this question. I thought about it a bit before uh, I came on. And I've been at this for quite a while, about seven years trying to do things the right way. And unlike a lot of people that just want to have just complete, you know, high end stuff in their collection, I've tried to build a very versatile collection to have snakes for the, the pet owner, something great around 50 to $150 to snakes up to eight, $10,000. Hmm. So I have a wide variety of stuff, you know, good, healthy, beautiful animals. So I have a little bit of everything for everybody, payment plans, what, whatever people need. You know, I try to have like the Bob Vu approach to things and try to help as many people as I can along the way. Right. Well, well and I think the fact that you've done projects and sold <clears throat> snakes to Leviathan speaks volumes of you right there. You know, like this is definitely a guy because Leviathan's not going to deal with somebody who treats their animals like shit or has bad husbandry, you know, so. Absolutely, uh, and, and full disclosure, I mean, I've, I've bought animals from them too. So, you know, we have a great relationship. They're some of my very best friends in this industry, so. Right, and and you've been doing this for seven years, you said. Yeah. yeah I, I I don't, you, you're, you're kind of uh, podcast and social media shy, right? Because I've seen you in the chats at a bunch of different podcasts. Yeah. But I haven't seen you as like a guest on one, uh, at least not yet. Uh, I've been on a few podcasts. I was on uh, Brian's uh, Balling with Brian and the Keeper's Corner once with the Canadian guy, you know, Jason. Right. <laughs> so I've been on there, um, but not too many other podcasts. And to be honest with you, I haven't really been invited. So it, it's oh. just kind of okay. one of those, you know. But, you know, if I was invited, I'd probably do a little more shows, you know, a little right. more podcasts. So. Right. Well, you're going to get invited after this, I think. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah, it wouldn't be too bad. Good good exposure. You know, any exposure is good exposure, I suppose. And and do you think after seven years you're still growing or are you kind of like, did you hit a definitely. hit a plateau that you want to hit? Oh, no, we're definitely still growing constantly. I am starting to get to that point where since I do all the care for the snakes myself, I'm, I'm reaching that point where I'm going to have to level off to the, you know, just to make sure that my husbandry doesn't slack at all in the collection. Okay. And you're married with kids. Do, do they help at all or no? Uh, my youngest son does help. He does. He takes a good interest in everything. But unfortunately, he lives with his mother in Louisville, Kentucky most of the time. And um, 
you know, so he's only down here during breaks in summertime, but hope, hopefully he wants, he seems to want to come down here and, uh, and do this af after, after school. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Oh, cool. Okay. But that's going to be a pretty far trip from Louisville, Kentucky to South Carolina. <laughs> Yeah, he's down here all summer during the summers, has been for the last few years. So, oh, cool. All right. Mm -hmm. And how many snakes do you have right now? Uh, currently, approximately 250, including of it, hatchlings, holdbacks, and available hatchlings. Jesus. And, and is this what you do for, for full time for work? Oh, uh, no, no, no. I, I work uh, for a company called 3DR Laboratories, and uh, it's a great job. I absolutely love it. I have no plans on leaving that job. So, at least not anytime soon. The the snakes for me, would I love to do it full time? Sure, but more like once I decide to retire, it would be right. Right. Just so the intention isn't to be Justin. No, honestly, I would rather be like a small scale Bob Vu. Just have a little bit of everything for everybody. Right. And then then just have my own personal projects that I really want to develop. And also, it's how it's all started. Was seeing snakes from justin or ozzy or you know even guys like shelby at mershon's or Corey right. along at cd constrictors just wanting to have those snakes but never being able to afford them myself so i've had to take the long road right right yeah i, I saw in your morph market are, are we really just calling a fucking um a yellow belly spot nose a batman maker now a lot of people associate the spot nose leopard clowns as Batman. So, you know, yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm only talking with you, but I think yeah. that's funny. Yeah. I, I'm I'm surprised that the Batman gene or the Batman combo has lasted so many years and is still demanding a decent price, you know. Well, that's because it's a great base to a lot of other projects. I mean, just adding cypress into that or a couple other genes or even seeing it with desert ghost is unbelievable so i think it just continues to be a good strong staple in in the industry right right no no i definitely do have you have you taken a hit with this uh correction that's going on in the last couple of years actually no we've been we've had the best sales in the last seven months we've ever had like, really but we we do about two shows a month um, we usually sell 15, around 15, sometimes a little more, around 20, sometimes a little less at these shows. But we do pretty well. Um, but, you know, last year we did 32 clutches, so that might have something to do with it as well. I have a whole lot more variety of things. Um, I don't find that the that the market for pet owners has diminished at all. It's just a lot of the breeders mid-range snakes the five five hundred to fifteen hundred dollar snakes have really cooled off but everything else seems to be selling really well still and are the shows by you fucking shitty repticons unfortunately most yes um i, I also uh have done some of the mickey meyer shows the show me snakes right uh, those are nice shows so okay mm -hmm. yeah i'm going to uh, his uh nashville show i think in uh i don't know april or may mm -hmm. yeah uh, i want to check that out because i went to the knoxville show right and uh huh, that was that was pretty hurting okay oh, so okay. wow uh, okay but it was what it was you know i, I heard that nashville is a lot better now uh, let's hop on to some sponsorship shit. um oh uh, here we go you know <laughs> i i don't know how you're gonna do with this one pal all Probably right not well do you use Reptichip? So JT is probably only going to give me a partial on that. I, I do not. I'm a, I'm a regional distributor for the chipper, but I do get my easy hatch trays and egg boxes from JT. So that, that. that would be great. But fucking easy hatch trays and egg boxes aren't sponsoring me. So JT gives you right. a full <laughs> on fuck you. Okay. <laughs> yep. That's all I'm saying. Have you ever been to a herp show? No, that's a little bit far from, from South Carolina have have never been. Yeah, no, I, I yeah, I, I guess that's reasonable. But Sean Gray still says fuck you. All right. Yeah, definitely. How do you have a focus cubed habitat cage in your house? Uh do not. Man. So basically you're just saying fuck Texas, right? Because 
Ashley and Steven give you a big old fuck you along mm-hmm. with JT. But yep. you use Morph Market. Absolutely. And Morph Market is a Texas company. So John Lehman does not give you a fuck you. Um, Blake Stewart already gave you a fuck you just on the fact that your wife did the logo. Okay. Yes. She's so an we're, artist, we're, you know. we're not even going to ask about that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> do you use Redline Shipping? Yes, I do. I do. Ah. Yes. Robin Marklin does not give you a fuck you. Use yeah. the code FATMAN5 for a $5 discount on your already discounted packages. Yeah, Redline's been very good to me, so I, I will definitely I fucking love them. Yes. Um, now, have you bought a snake from Canova? I, I have multiple oh. snakes. From that may Dave offset Jacob. this next question, then. Do you use Clutch? I do not. I, I do not. I do not use any... Uh, software to for for the uh for the husbandry you I remind me of like a card thing. guy right you're probably like a card guy uh some but i'm also i also use clips uh and i have like a big dry erase board with all the breeders on it to keep track of that so all right yeah. well well you bought a snake from justin but you don't use clutch so that kind of mm-hmm. cancels out the fuck you okay so <laughs> yeah Good for you, but, right. but really, you did pretty fucking horrible here. Um, right. you, you know, I mean, why can't you be a distributor for Rep Rep Chip? Uh, you mean, <laughs> well, so the honest answer with that is uh, I was at Daytona a couple years ago and picked up uh, a block of the uh, chipper and I got some cocoa to go. I used it and basically begged Chris to be a distributor here in South Carolina. Uh, I just really preferred the cocoa to go is the best thing I've ever used. Uh, and the chippers right there. I prefer the bigger chunks. It just seems to hold humidity in the tubs longer. Repta chip's a great product. I used to use it. Um, but I, I prefer, I prefer I'm the just product. Saying, you, you should check out Repta chunk. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you, you know, you're a nice guy, so we're not going to hold that shit, you know, yeah. again. Right now. Um, what's your biggest project right now? uh for this season uh got a shot to hit some desert ghost puzzles um but working right now um i did a collab last season with leviathan on some sunset ultramail stuff desert ghost sunset stuff i'm working on uh different clown pied ultramels um but a non-recessive project that i'm very much into is bonfires you know, one of my biggest jaw-dropping snakes I ever saw was the very first Tenley I attended. And I walked up to Ben Rennick's table and saw that that campfire on his table. And uh, right. I've just been obsessed with those ever since. Right, right. I'm surprised that hasn't caught on more, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, now, seven years. Yeah. How much money did you put in? And how much money have you taken out? So... Over the entire course of seven years, I'd say I'm probably a, roughly about 110k in. Okay. And so far, in the last three years, I would have been almost break even. Um, I'm probably around 75, 80 thousand on return now. But then I acquired uh, a collection uh, in Credimorph. I acquired uh, acquired that collection, and then. Uh, then bought a couple of really high end animals from Bob. So, uh, so now I'm back down about, about 20. After doing okay. That. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's still remarkable that you've made, you, you know, three quarters of that back in three years. So, right. so I really, agree. you know, go you, uh, now how could people get in touch with you if they want to get in touch with you? Best way, Instagram all day where I'm on Instagram, probably three or four times a day. Um, on Facebook, there is a balls and strikes Python Facebook, but I'm never on there. My personal page, you can see Troy Woodruff on Facebook. You can get a hold of me there easily. And then, uh, oh, uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, but you, you could finish up, but, um, you, 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 you're doing a YouTube channel or you I'm already like, have yeah, one. I need to, I really need to. It seems, I, I mean, 
I'm trying to convince Steven to help me out with it a little bit. He said he would. So uh, get some tips and tricks from him. I love their YouTube channels at yeah. Leviathan. So hopefully he'll help me out a little bit with it. And because uh, I'm, I'm pretty not tech savvy on, on doing a lot of stuff. And, you know, I'm 52. So, you know, I do know some stuff, but not a whole lot. So. So, yeah, I, that needs to get off the ground. And I'd like to say I've been lazy and not do it. But honestly, dealing with the size collection I have and working a full time job, I'm, I'm really putting in a ton of hours as it is now and, and breeding my own rodents as well. So, oh, yeah, that's even <clears throat> that's even grosser. Uh, uh, Troy, thank you yeah. so much, man, for hanging out with me. My pleasure. <clears throat> I appreciate it. Everybody Absolutely. go to Balls and Strikes on Instagram and follow him because. Troy actually has some nice shit and he's working with puzzle, which I think is probably still one of the top three recessives out there. And, uh, you know, not, not to set a precedent and prove that Sean Bradley was right about something, but <laughs> you know, he fucking, he's doing good with the puzzle thing, man. Uh, Troy, thanks again, brother. And, uh, I will uh, let you know when this is coming out. We'll go from there. I appreciate you having me on, and uh, Keisha better tell her man I'm coming for him. I'm That's what I'm saying. Him. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Keisha, Throw down. Get, get your man in check. I'm coming for him. We're doing Throw, this. Throw down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. I'll talk to you later, man. Thanks, man. Have Bye. a good one. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, Snakes in the Batman proudly brings to you its new breeder segment, 15 Minutes of Lame! Listen guys, Stewart Design doesn't just create logos, they build brands. What do I mean by this? Well, your brand has both a verbal and visual side. Think of this as your brand message and brand image. Your brand message is what initially draws clients to you and continually generates new business. After that, the quality of your product and service keeps them coming back and retains them. Without effective messaging, you're only going to be connecting with a small percentage of the clients you could be connecting with. Your brand message helps you clearly define who you are, how are you different from your competitors, what value you offer to your clients, and why potential clients should choose you over others. For this reason, Stewart Design always starts branding projects by developing your brand's message first. Creating a logo without understanding why and how it needs to look is only going to hold your company back and should be considered fucking malpractice. Stewart Design starts by clarifying your goals, audience, and industry. Then they form your messaging. After that, they strategically determine what colors, styles, and fonts make the most sense to use. And then finally, how the logo needs to look and function. You see, the visual identity of a company should be a natural result of proper strategy. Because the question really shouldn't be, do I like this? It should be, will this work? Stewart Design figures out what will actually work and provides you with a true investment to grow your business. When done right, it should attract the right people and it should reflect your business properly. It should make your company more memorable and it should build trust and credibility with your clients. On the other hand, if it's done poorly, it could do the exact opposite. It could make you look amateur and can actually deter your business. Don't settle for a fucking idiot that simply offers you a cheap logo. Build your brand the right way. Bring out your best so you could get it right from the start and finally move out of your mother's fucking basement, crush it at Tindley, Pomona, or Arlington, and build a life for yourself doing what you love. Contact Stewart Design today. You could reach them at sdidentity.com. Again, that's sdidentity.com. Like I said before, I don't own any reptiles right now, but I do own two fucking fat bastard frogs right there, and they are from this guy, Spencer Tedesco at A Tree Frog Collective, and I gotta tell you, 
everything went so smooth with him when I bought him. I, I mean, I called the guy. I talked to him for like two or three weeks before I even bought the things. I still call him for advice on the fucking frogs. The guy is just a true fucking gentleman. And I fucking love the guy so much, I wanted to have him on the show. Because I have a love-hate relationship with these fucking frogs. You all know that. Uh, but still, Spencer puts out some of the greatest, most beautiful tree frog fucking combinations and morphs in the hobby. Fucking, you gotta love this kid. Here's my one-on-one -on -one with Spencer Tedesco of a tree frog collective. What's up, everybody? Look who I have here. My my frog guy. My fucking frog guy, Spencer Tedesco of a tree frog collective. What's up, brother? What's up, Chris? How are you, sir? And I am popping your fucking podcast cherry, correct? Yes, sir. It's my first one. This is what we do. I mean, it's a little bit more fun when it's the women, but, you know, I'll, I'll take it either way. Yeah, you know, a pop cherry is a pop cherry. It still fucking counts in the record books, right? Yes, it does. So uh, talk to me. Talk to me about a tree frog collective. Well, uh, just doing my thing here, breeding tree frogs and different kind of reptiles and amphibians and you know, focusing right now on uh, mainly mutations uh, that uh, I'm crossing together and uh, hopefully be able to establish like a good group so I could, uh, you know, start selling to the to the public and uh, and getting my frogs out there. You know? Well, and and how long have you been doing this, man? Uh, well, I, I started with breeding uh, when I was about 13 years old. I would say that's when I first produced my, my first reptile. So, uh, I, I, you know, from there on, it was just uh, collecting different species, you know, networking as a kid, you know, taking those animals that I bought from them and coming back to the shows and, and bring, you know, more of them back to them to sell to them and then to trade up to get the new species to work on. So, uh, I kind of was going back and forth with uh, different reptiles uh, from an early age. And then when I was about 19, 20 years old, I, I started focusing on snakes. And uh, I started getting into the ball py python market and uh, the boa constrictor game. So, you know, I, I had a, a lot of influence from the older guys, you know, that I was working for currently and uh, that I kind of grew up around, like, you know, that were very heavy in uh, ball pythons and boas. So, you know, I just... Uh, I was like uh, in more into the mutations when I started off. Like it was like kind of like art, you know, to me. Like, right. you know, I saw it more in a sense that I wanted to create new and like uh, exciting things that weren't like normal looking. You know, like that's right. really like where I get it from. Uh, are you still doing ball pythons? Uh, no, man. I I have one yeah, pair of ball that. pythons yeah. <laughs> right now. Um, I you know the snake game. It treated me well. I. Met a lot of great people, you know, I got into like so many projects uh, over my head sometimes, you know, the the market was, up, was always up and down and uh, and things also with life, you know, to try to keep a, uh, an animal alive for three to five years before you can actually reproduce it and see some of your, your money back that you invested into it. You know, it, it took a toll on me sometimes, you know, because I, I right. started so young that I, I just didn't have my priorities straight. and. Uh, you know, I, I learned the hard way, you know, like going, trying to go too big, you know, too fast. So uh, from there, you know, like it kind of slowed, slowed down and uh, I kind of I had to take a step away, you know, from uh, breeding and keeping and kind of like regroup myself. And right. uh, and then once I, I, you know, I was able to uh, get back on my feet, I, you know, I really, you know, I had the passion to start uh, breeding again and, and getting into to reptiles and amphibians and, you know, the, the white tree frog. You know, it's a, it kind of put a spark in, in me again to, to start breeding and venturing. Now, when you started up again, you started with the white street frogs? No, I, I actually started uh, with uh, some poison dart frogs. I had different species of so dart frogs, some mantellas, uh, red-eyed tree frogs. And uh, then uh, I noticed that there there was unique white tree frogs that were out in the in the market that some people had. But not very many people were breeding them or not many people had the access to them to, to get these mutations. So that's when, you know, it's set in me that, you know, I think it should be a move that I should make and, and try to, you know, get as much as I could and learn the genetics, you know, and uh, I'll work my way up the chain, you know, of, of being a frog breeder. And, you know, that's where, uh, you know, the, the white tree frog and, 
and a bunch of other species actually that I'm working with right now that I have here is just it's going to be able to set me apart from the other guys. You know, right. Well, well, speaking of the other guys, I mean, as far as I know, I, I mean, I, I don't know a lot of other white tree frog breeders in the country. So it, it's obviously not as crowded as the ball python market, right? No, no, because uh, the thing is, your stock has to come from someone that is a, a, a reputable breeder that's not using hormones or you know, or doing anything uh, sideways, you know, to to get these tadpoles. So like I, I use all you know natural breeding. I cycle my frogs, you know, put them in a rain chamber. You know, we do everything natural here. I make my own protein and algae mix. You know, food for them. So I've I've spawned quite a few. Uh, frogs to put out there that uh, the new guys that are in the hobby and a lot of the, the up and comers have been able to get my stock and start breeding as well. So, right. you know, I've, I've been able to put out some real healthy animals out there to, to get other breeders as well involved in it because there's a high demand for it and I can't supply everyone. So I just let everyone else kind of work with the normal stuff and right. I, I kind of keep the, the projects that I want to uh to establish more to myself and and uh you know cross what i need to and uh, selectively breed for more pattern and more colors and and that and that's really what i focus on because uh it, it just kind of sets me apart from them and uh it gives them a little bit uh more of a of a how do you say um uh, want you know like a drive to want to keep breeding giving getting more people involved in into amphibians so like i right. i kind of want to put myself you know, a couple levels ahead of everyone and, uh, and put out some cool stuff, man. So, so who were some of your influences on this? Oh man. Like I, I would say, you know, like there's this a lot of old school people that are in the hobby that they've read every species and they kept uh, everything. So, you know, I, I started off, I can't, I'd have to start with Amir Soleimani, you know, like Amir is, that guy, you know, he he got me into into the game, and you know, he he let me into his business and and let me access into what it was like to be a reptile breeder and dealer, right. and and showed showed me the way, you know, of basically what what it was like in the actual business side of of reptiles, and 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 then from there on, you know, like Tracy Barker was a big influence of me with boa constrictors. You know, we, I, I was very close with her, you know, when I was, when I was into snakes, uh, right. Little parks, uh, it was, was a local South Florida breeder that uh, established a lot of uh, boa constrictor breedings and, and pythons, you know, those are, those are some guys in South Florida, it, extreme reptiles, you know, like he was a big importer, Mario from zoological, you know, that they, they, they were guys that they would bring in, uh, stuff and, give me access to be able to pick out what I wanted and, and see what was coming in and try to, you know, try to selectively breed my stuff and, and make cool stuff, you know? So I'll, are I'll you, say, are you originally from South Florida? Yeah. I'm originally from Miami, Florida. Okay. I, I moved out here to, to California, to the West coast uh, about seven years ago. Okay. And what, what made you move out there? Uh, well, it was a, definitely a, a change of scenery and, uh, and for work. You know, to to start a, a a business out here and and uh, join forces uh, out here with uh, with some of the West Coast guys and and you know just uh, see what it's all about. You know, like right. it was just a, a, an opportunity that came for me, and uh, I was able to you know get my feet on the ground here and uh, and just start it up and start traveling up and down you know the West Coast doing shows. Right. So so you're you're currently a show guy. I saw you had a couple of different setups on your uh, Instagram. Yeah, I've, I've traveled up and down the West Coast. Uh, you know, I was, start, I was selling isopods in the beginning. I was breeding a lot of a variety of isopods, uh, doing the dart frogs and, uh, you know, buying and flipping uh, different species, getting stuff, you know, imported in, in uh, big groups, you know, doing what, what I've done basically my, my whole life. You know, I, I imported reptiles from Suriname, from Guyana, you know, I, I brought in stuff from uh, Hong Kong, you know, all, all over the world. So it's like I kind of had uh, more access here in the, in the West Coast of uh, being able to see like more of a, uh, you know, it's more of a collector's uh, type state over here. There's a lot of it's a lot of variety here and a lot more people that want like unique animals, 
And, right. And, and you know, it's it's definitely a fun place to be with to, to working with reptiles. And you're out in Orange County, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Good deal. And uh, the, breeding frogs a little bit different than breeding uh, snakes, huh? Like what? I mean, I mean, what was the 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 uh, process of change? Because you, you could just put two frogs together, but you have to be, you, well, you know, it's it's a it's a process, man. I I would say it's just I keep everything like the formula the same with uh, with all my animals. I just make sure that they have like the right conditions. First of all, like their living conditions, and then uh, just go through a seasonal change. Make sure that they can uh, naturally cycle themselves, so that I don't have to add any hormones or do anything, you know, to them to to get them to want want to breed. You know, right? Like, it's it's more of the environment for me. Um, it's been it's a lot. It's it's a lot easier to raise a a, a frog for me and reproduce it in within a few years than having to raise a baby snake and keep it three, four or five years, you know, on, on a strict diet, you know, it, it's just the, the process of it for me is, uh, it's a lot quicker now. And for me, it's, it's, I know if I do A and B, C usually is next and I will get my results with snakes, you know, it's, I, I just, in my experience, it's just, I feel like the waiting period well, kind of uh, gets me distracted and not focus uh, as focused as I could be and be on point, you know, when I'm right. with, when I'm doing handling the frogs. So, but uh, now you, you, you basically put two frogs together, right? You, you do, can you see them copulating? Can you see them? Well, you, you want to first, you want to cycle them so that the eggs develop with the female. Okay. okay, and then you want to cool down that male and cycle cycle these frogs so where that you know sperm will be viable. You know they need to be right. at the temperatures uh, to where they can naturally cycle so that they can have huge spawns. You know they, they just don't make four or five six you know dozen eggs. You know we're talking about one thousand two thousand clutch eggs. So it's like it's uh, it's it's more on that once I know that the frog is ready and. I, I'm getting a lot of calls and stuff, and uh, I'm seeing the way they're acting and how your frogs that say, you know, they're more hiding in the bottom or they're up right. top active. It's all basically what your environment is showing for them because they they will respond to according how your parameters of their environment is. So right, but once the frog is actually gravid, but when, when she's loaded up, she yeah. she will be in the water waiting and uh, the males will be making calls. So it will kind of be sometimes a battle between the males to, to get there, get their attention to that female. And once right. they lock in, it's a process uh, anywhere from 10 minutes that she could stop drop, start dropping eggs and he's fertilizing them. Or it could be two to three days of them being locked together and there's no action yet. There's no eggs in the water. And it's just him squeezing on and stressing her out and trying to get her to unload that, that spawn. And but, was, but you have to know when to move those frogs into the water, right? Uh, yeah, well, the thing is, uh, the rain chambers that I build gives them the opportunity to be able to pick the female that they want and take them down into the water. So I try wow. to keep it and replicate it as like, natural as possible as it, it would be in the wild. You know, okay. I, I, my, my whole thing is the environment is, is going to be the biggest factor uh, as far as how your results are going to be for breeding. Well, and, and how long is the process of a female developing eggs and then knocking out the eggs in the water? And then how long is the process from the eggs in the water to tadpoles? And then how long is the process from tadpoles to actual frogs? Well, um, so uh, during the, the winter months, starting usually like September, October, that's when I'll, I'll start like feeding them very heavy and uh, getting them ready to, to cool them down and cycle them down and put them away basically where it's like, you know, just uh, the environment of, of a seasonal change happening where then in the wild, they're going to go into hiding and, uh, and try to stay warm and, and, uh, and have some sort of moisture. So I dry them out a little bit. I give them that seasonal change. And uh, when January, February starts coming and uh, we're getting 
the you know the rain cycles here the, the our thunderstorms here you know then that's when i start to uh, open them up bring them out warm them up feed, start power feeding them basically getting them back into their natural uh ways and when the heat rises they just start developing eggs you know and yeah once once that seasonal change hits it's gonna get them to ovulate you know they're gonna be full of eggs and uh and it's gonna get the males to start calling so it's it's just for me uh what well, i would say once i get eggs within 24 to 48 hours they're already hatching you know from that That's back, quick. okay yeah, from from there you're uh separating all the frogs out you know you're letting them the eggs hatch on their on their own and then uh doing some water changes getting some real you know clear clean water so that uh, they can grow and, and uh, naturally, and you can start feeding them. You know, I, I start feeding them with them a few days, and uh, from there I'll, I'll start getting you know frogs anywhere from three to four weeks out of the water. Okay. And, and then from there it takes you know anywhere from two to three weeks of uh, of letting them uh, you know absorb their tails, start on feeding, and and getting them to a, a you know a solid size where. You can uh, start now separating them out and, and uh, establishing them. So it's well, and cool. and they lay like what, like a hundred eggs at a time, right? No, about a thousand eggs to two thousand. About a thousand eggs at a time. <laughs> yeah, right. So you, you can have tadpole spawns anywhere from five hundred to three thousand. You know, so it's it's a lot of Jesus it's a lot of Christ. work and a lot of separating. And, um, so, man, so genetically, what are the odds for the tadpoles like, like how how long will it be before you could tell this is a, a snowflake this is a gold flake this is a super snowflake this is a blue how long does it take for that to happen so um this like with the pairings that i do uh it's always like kind of been like something new is popping out uh, with with what i've been putting together but uh right off the bat you know the snowflakes are covering the frogs so you know if they're big big snowflakes you're gonna have a frog that looks like 90 percent white you know no, it's sure. right off the water so it, you know it, you can tell what our genes are already you know they're established you know the recessive and dominant genes here that we have with the white street frogs and uh you you can see it right off the bat when they're coming out of the water you know the honey blue eyes they have blue eyes they're very light 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 colored um, right the goldens they come out like it's almost like a goldish yellow color right out of the water. And then they turn that, that gold and orange as they get into adults. And, uh, and my snowflakes are born very dark, uh, the blue ones, and uh, just covered in white. And uh, we, we have now a gene that we're working with here that's uh, it's a black-eyed translucent that uh, turns into like a melanistic type uh, frog. So that's, it's cool to see that you know come out of the water. That's, it's completely transparent. You can see it's hard and all its organs. And, it's no high, shit. black and completely safe. right so three three Jeez, right and, and you're getting a thousand of these at a time yeah, yeah a right. and how many frogs are you breeding uh oh, yeah, cur it. currently right now i i have anywhere about 200 adult frogs to uh, to breed so i i try to just pair things so that i know exactly what uh, genes i'm working with and right. I have I have a variety to, to work with right now, so I'm like trying to target the some of the newer stuff and and trying to add in a fresh blood of a snowflake that came from the wild that was imported about two years ago that I have now in my collection and I I finally got my first spawn, so I'll have now my my own line of snowflake that I introduced straight into my other line of gold flake, so uh, it's gonna be uh, something new that I've never seen and. And their snowflakes are two totally different uh, patterns. Like one really looks like a true snowflake, and and my gold flake is you know scattered with gold flakes, and and it's a bloodline that's uh, mixed with another wild caught frog bred into a sandfire bloodline uh, super snowflake. So you know it's like I have a, a spawn right now that's going to come out of the water. It's you know three different uh, bloodlines together. So hopefully, you know, something uh, rad comes out, man. But, but do you, I, I mean, you're getting a thousand frogs at once. Do you have any trouble selling these things? Uh, no, man. No, there's such a demand right now, you know, that 
it's it's been uh there's a waiting list basically for some of my frogs it's just it's a constant uh a constant emails and and dms about you know certain frogs that i have if i if i have availability for them so i'm, I'm trying right now to focus on on making them available for right and well and do you wholesale a bunch uh, of frogs every year uh the, the, well um the wholesale market is a tough one because it's mainly like a lot of the lower end stock that people breed and then a lot of breeders that uh they get a lucky spawn or you know they they put a pair of frogs together and uh you know they get a couple hundred frogs and they have no market for them they have no outlets right. for them so then you know that price goes down they wholesale it right. to some dealers and you know it's just a natural flow thing so what i've been trying to focus on is uh not frogs that were wholesale you know that just stuff that i can retail and uh stuff that i will hold back myself all of them and uh and just cross back into the new stuff and then okay. make it make it available so R right but don't you end up with like a thousand frogs that way yes i do yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes I do. Yep. <laughs> you know you have to it's the it's the only way you're not guaranteed uh a frog is gonna be a producer you know like it's a it's just one of those things that you need to you need to hold on what you can uh to, to get ahead and uh, right and try to make the next the next best thing and that for me it's 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 worth it for me because i, I have a passion to to keep things you know growing and alive and, and make sure that they they do well here so well is this your full-time gig yes it is yes it is. so you're just producing ten thousand frogs every year that's that's my goal and I, now i'm producing you know quite a few different reptiles in, uh, in big numbers so you know that's going to be another outlet that uh i'm going to be able to uh, show my animals to you know the bearded dragons uh the leopard geckos you know i i have different variety different snakes and uh, a variety of different geckos that i'm working with but uh mainly i'm you know I'm, I'm, i pick a certain species and a certain look that i like you know not necessarily what everyone else is breeding or what they like but uh i try to you know try to make as many as I can to see what the gene, you know, what the genetics are, are what, what, what I can play with. And, and if there's a potential to make something else out of it. So, you know, like that's, you know, that's my main focus right now. Well, and, and what the amphibians though, is there uh incomplete dominance, like what the, uh, with the ball Python world, or is it mainly just recessive? Uh, there, there is uh, both right now, but there's not many genes that, that we have to, to play with. So um, the right now, the snowflakes uh, is like a dominant gene. The, the higher the white that you have uh, uh, plays effect onto what is passed on to the babies. But also there is spotted genes and real snowflake genes. You know, the sandfire line is something special because they it just creates something new on the on the next breeding and what i was able to do is get the frogs and bring in something else that came from the wild and all of a sudden it just created this gold patterning on my frogs and gold like not even spots but like complete gold skin you know on right. over the top of on these blue frogs so that's now something that i'm trying to see with outcrossing them into the wild cost snowflakes if if something else is popping out or if it is dominant you know, if, it, if, if I can hit it on three straight generations, you know, I think it is something dominant, you know, so right. I, I'm just, I'm playing around right now. You know, it's, it's just, it's a learning game. Every uh, breeding, it's something new, something, something new pops out for me. So I'm just, uh, you know, just excited for right now because I have tons of tadpoles right now that are, uh, that are forming and a lot of, a lot of spawns right now in the water. So, so right. starting off good. And, and and you do a bunch of other reptiles, right? But the, obviously the frogs are the most yep. financially uh, profitable, right? And uh, I have no trouble, you know, working with any species and, and being able to sell them, you know, because just for the fact that I try not to uh, breed the normal average stuff that everyone else has, you know, I try right. to make, yeah, I try to, when I get into a, a, an animal, I, I try to study the market a little bit. And then also what genes are at play, what, you know, what conditions the animal is going to need first and see if it works great in my environment and the way and how I keep things right now. Um, and, and then I go, I go from there. It's just, uh, it's, it's very easy for me just to f feed an animal 
give it the right environment and let it do its thing and, and breathe. And, uh, right. Breathe. Okay. Please excuse this brief interruption for a word from one of our sponsors. How fucking thrilled am I to have Focus Cubed Habitats joining the snakes and the fat man family? They are literally the best display cages that I've ever owned. I, I, I was a fan of this husband and wife team of builders from when they were putting out these amazing pieces of fucking art from their garage. Steven and Ashley have been keeping reptiles for years and as experienced keepers, they understand how important your animals are in your life. Focus Cubed Habitats provide security and comfort for your animals while maintaining these insane, badass designs that everyone can appreciate. They give you the opportunity to make their home part of your home. You want options? They've got options. Every Focus Cubed Habitat is custom made to your specs, and you could choose from hundreds of options on their website. Too many options? Ashley and Steven have a huge selection of blog style articles and complete accessory fact pages on their website to help educate consumers about add-ons that will best fit their individual needs. Listen, at the end of the day, these fucking cages are showpieces. Every cage their focus builds will be the centerpiece of your reptile room. Hell, they could be the centerpiece of your fucking living room. If you have reptiles that you want to display, Look no further than Focus Cubed Habitats. You can follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and even fucking TikTok. Or just go old school and, and go right to FocusCubedHabitats.com and tell them that the fat man told you to drop them a line. Hey there, this is Robin at Redline Shipping. I just want to take a quick moment to shout out U.S. ARC. U.S. ARC is our political lobby that protects our rights to keep and enjoy live reptiles in the United States. Uh, there's a lot of movements and a lot of legislation to try and ban reptiles, regulate reptiles, and restrict our ability uh, to keep these uh, terrific animals. Uh, Phil Goss is the head of U.S. ARC, and he works hard across the country in many states to fight the constant legislation that tries to ban particular species, uh, outlaw animals in general, and uh, essentially is trying to shut down our industry. It's important that we support U.S. ARC. It's uh, important to join U.S. ARC. It's important to donate to U.S. ARC. At Redline Shipping, we have a small little donation feature. Uh, when you do book a label that by default adds $1 of support uh, to U.S. ARC. And over the course of a year, that amounts to tens of thousands of dollars that goes to USR and gives them uh, more funds to be able to fight these battles. It's important that we uh, support USR as a hobby uh, and as an industry. It's, it supports our future. We can't do what we do unless you are, USR is able to do their jobs. So uh, when you're booking a shipment of Redline Shipping, $1, that's all I ask. So we can forward that to U.S. ARC and keep up the good fight. When you're at a show and there's a U.S. ARC auction, donate some money. Buy an item. That money is going to support Phil and support his work in protecting our future to do what we do. It's serious business. We have to be able to uh, enjoy the reptiles as a hobby, but also as an industry. So please get out there, support U.S. ARC, join U.S. ARC, and let's keep our future uh, very positive and possible. Thanks. Well, and uh, do the uh, the tree frogs benefit from UV lights? Um, so uh, that's a tough one uh, to answer. I I believe all you know reptiles and amphibians need some form of UVB or some form of lighting, uh, but nocturnal species they're not out during the day, you know, like they're hidden in the canopy. They're tucked away uh, where they're not getting very much exposure at all, if any. So I think it more of it as uh, keeping them on a light schedule so that they can have just a, like a natural setting, you know, right. for the frogs, because they're, they're nocturnal creatures. 
You know, there if your frog is basking during the day under a light, it's usually probably because your environment's too small for them and they have nowhere to go. And uh, right. you know, it's it's just usually the case, you know. So I've I've been able to keep them in big setups, study them, see what what they're able to do and what their capabilities of and what what they want in in their environment and uh and just you know from there just feed them and, and keep them happy and, the, and they do their thing right now now with the frogs um is it total darkness at night for you or do you have some kind of night light there or oh total total darkness i don't total i don't darkness. need any night lights uh if if the environment needs uh, to be warmed, uh, infrared, uh, uh, heat, ceramic heating, the heat panels work well. But I don't use any any night lights or any kind of moon lights or anything for for my reptiles. Oh, all I, right. I feel it's just uh, added, you know, stress to it, or you know, it's, it's unnecessary for me to keep. Them Maybe up. that's why mine are always hiding because I I always have a small, you know, I have the the uh, the fader light on like three at any given time so it's pretty you know you look in there you could see you know oh, yeah. no definitely if you could tone it down for them that mm -hmm. will get them to climb higher in the environment into the cage and be higher up so if, if you're out in the wild and you see frogs hidden door in the bushes you know burrowed more it's it's because they hide you know like they're right. once that light's going out it's they they're nocturnal they don't want to be around be around light so well, I mean, my, my frogs are retarded during the daytime, okay? <laughs> so I, I I didn't want to turn the light all the way out, uh, you know, and think that they'd maybe be just totally blind and they'd be knocking into things in the, in the yeah. middle of the night, you know? The reflection of the glass with a white tree frog, it sets off and they just see something moving. It could be your reflection and they think it's a bug and they go after it. So right, that, that, right. That's what's so cool about these these guys is that you know they're always ready to eat. You know they're always making calls, and you know they, at any given time, you know they're trying to swallow your finger. You know while you're handling them. So well, well, also I, I noticed that when there's like an explosion on TV, uh, the the amount of calls that come out of that fucking cage are. I mean, it's loud as fuck. You know, all day long, man. You can you can hear it down the street. When I got you know 100 frogs making a call, you know right. when I have one one adult male horned frog breeding, mm -hmm. you, know, you can you probably can hear it for a few houses down, <laughs> a few <laughs> warehouses down right there. It's like <laughs> you can still hear it, man. It's it's that loud. They're, they're so weird. it's not weird that a other noise would activate them calling. Nope, they, anything from a you know a horn, something dropping, your pen dropping, your phone dropping, right. uh, music, you know. Like I, I'm heavy into metal and uh, and some you know hardcore music, so I have I have it blasting in the building, so they they know they go off, you know, right when the music goes off. And when right. breathing season is going on, I'm I'm playing a lot of uh, heavy music for them to to get it get it set off. <laughs> Jesus Christ! All right. So now, besides doing this, what what are what are some other hobbies? Uh, not not that this is a hobby, obviously, because this is your what you know way of work. But do you ever get tired of this and be like, I got to go out and do something else for a day or for whatever? Uh, no, I, you know, I like to be stay active, you know, and, and outdoors. You know, I, I like a, a lot a lot of fishing, you know, hiking stuff like that. Like, you know, me and my girlfriend, you know, we, we've hiked a bunch of different areas here in California. You know, there's a lot of preserves and like wildlife areas that, you know, right. we wouldn't normally think there would be in some of these cities. Here. Right. So, uh, just basically just, you know, stay on my feet. We have, you know, we have three dogs here that uh, usually, you know, take up a lot of our time and, uh, you know, just just hang out, man. I, I'm, you know, like to keep it simple, not not go out you know, and do crazy stuff, you know, or right. it's just uh, mainly, uh, you know, work with the animals and trying to establish, you know, myself in this, in this hobby and, and, and grow right now and grow this business to where, you know, I can take some time off and put some guys in there and that can help me out. But, but right, right now it's like the things that, that I keep and, and what I have, it's just, I need to be responsible, you know, for them. And, uh, and it's like, I'm not, I'm not ready yet to, uh, to expand with uh 
with anyone else you know helping me out or anything like right. i want to focus more on you know i definitely have those guys that you know they go clean tanks for me and and uh bust out some stuff to help me out in storage and, and get things going for the shows you know there's a lot of a lot of people that have helped me out on, on the way there but uh as far as you know the handling of the day-to-day -day, it's i just keep it to myself i do everything myself do you have kids no nope, no kids fucking nice that's the way to do it don't yeah. become part of the problem there's yeah. no need for them okay yeah. I, got, uh, I got a very needy uh 10 month old english bulldog that, that runs circles around me so. oh dude <laughs> I, I i had a 10 month old english bulldog yeah that we actually imported from hungary yeah oh. and um Fucking six thousand dollars the goddamn thing cost us, and uh, then then another thousand dollars for the plane ticket to get it here, and then the airport was like four hours away. This was when I was living in Colorado. I'm not gonna drive to the fucking airport for four hours, so I hired a guy to do that. It, it ended up costing me like seventy five hundred for this dog that immediately shit on my rug, immediately like fucking. <laughs> And you just look at him and you're like, son of a bitch, man, right? But I wanted a dog that was like me, you know, like would get out of breath real easy, would be overweight, couldn't jump into the fucking truck, you know? And um, it didn't even walk down the stairs. It just fell down the stairs, right? And so whenever the dog would come in, you'd hear, -da 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 -da. and then the dog would land, and then he'd just come into my office, right? And uh, then he would come into my office. I'd be on the phone. He would just take a shit on the rug. And if he could, he would have gave me the finger, right? Like, right, right while he did it. Like, like, that dog fucking hated me. Um, his, his name was Regis and fucking, uh, like, every time. I, I just said, I was just like, Regis, Christ. You know, like, fucking had to get rid of him, right? I had the dog for, like, four months. I was like, you know what? There's too many shit piles in this house on the rug. And what we're constantly cleaning the rugs. So we gave the $7,500 dog away, okay? And then I saw the dog like three years later, and it was a fucking tank. Oh. And fucking, he, he just still looked at me and just gave me the finger fucking again. He's like, yeah, fuck you. I'm, I'm glad I left your fucking they, house. They gave him a good home, though? They, doing they, well they did. They gave him a home with a backyard, and, you know, like, they, really, they took care of him. Uh, they're, I, I, they're more of a responsibility than than trip towels and amphibians. Oh fuck yeah, right. I, I mean, you get the dog from day one. It's like it's been working with asbestos for its whole life, right? It has trouble breathing. It's like fucking. It, it it's just uh, it's definitely not a beginner dog, you know. But that was when like we had fuck you money, and we're like, yeah, seventy five hundred on a dog, no problem, you know. Nowadays, I'm like, fuck that, you know? That was a beginner entry level of ball python in 2003. Dude, seriously, <laughs> right? Yeah, fuck. I, I remember our, our uh, we bought an albino in like 2002 for like seven grand, right? And um, yeah, now, now you can get them for 40 bucks wholesale. Yeah, that was a good investment on my end. Um, Just think about it. It's one of those like where the corn snake market went. You know, yeah. they they how many crosses can you do to, right, right. to get get the interest uh, in other people? So it, it's just one of those games where you gotta stack multiple genes, you know, but make some quality, healthy animals and uh, and, and put them out there. You know, it's it's your it's a lot of competition. You know, like oh yeah, it, fuck yeah, it, and and you know, unless you're an importer that, that has access to new genes uh, from Africa or however. That that goes anymore because you know they figured out how to how to do it themselves over there, you know. Right. It's it's one of those things where to be ahead in that and to produce in numbers, you have to produce your own rats, and right. you got to keep quality, healthy animals that, that right. will reproduce for you. You know, it's well, it's more about a husbandry uh, game now for me. I think if you can keep your animals set up perfect and, and healthy and and thriving, then and that, that's where you know you can get ahead in this game well and, and you, you know speaking of the ball python thing is there the amount of drama in the frog world that there is in the ball python world oh yeah and you know we're dealing with uh, every ass walk of life you know from <laughs> by someone buying their kids a pet a uh, 70 year old lady that keeps the tank by her bedroom at night you know that hand feeds them 
to the random, you know, flipper that just, you know, he doesn't, can't sell the animals he sells. And he sees me, you know, me selling white street frogs and he's going to put some on his table. So it's like, every, you know, everybody uh, can get access, get their hands on onto a, a white street frog and, and, and do well with it. So it's like, they want the next level, the next snowflake. So it's just, there's a comp, not a competition, but I would say there's always other breeders trying to make that one frog, that spectacular looking frog, since we don't, we don't have that, uh, uh, the, the genetic uh, availability that, that other uh, species do. So right. I'm sure there's, there's different characters, you know, that keep, that keep these animals and, you know, they up front, everyone's cool with me. You know, they, they come to me at the shows. We, you know, we, we have a good time, but I just, I stay away from uh, any of the, the negativity or the, or the drama side of it because I can't please everyone and I can't give access to everyone or, you oh, know, man. just to anyone. This, this is the wrong show for you to be on then, man. Uh, <laughs> the wrong, wrong show to start your podcasting career on. Uh, <laughs> I, so, I just it, it, I, when when I when I'm saying I I'm gonna make my animals available, you know, like the how I do my business and how I handle things and how how I, I how I'm growing myself and how, I know and how I do things. Like it's just that's you know it's like my sauce, you know, it's my secret right. sauce. And I I just I do things a certain way that some people probably they they just they can't do it or they just they don't agree with it or you know it's not something they can just you know, file them on their own, you know? So it's like, I just try to keep it my way and, uh, you know, and let, let everyone else do their thing and let them grow the, their business themselves and let them make healthy frogs themselves and put the time and effort, you know, because I, I'll tell you this much, like for me to be introducing uh, some of these frogs out to the rest of the world, like it's taken me some time to keep things, to learn new things and, and, uh, and, and mainly just raising them up, you know, like the, right. the time I put in, from from when I first started breeding frogs, you know, I'm every year I've been doing spawns now for the last six years. So, you know, I well, the the first way that I heard of you uh, was from Miguel. Yeah. So when Miguel bought from you and then did that video, uh, did you notice a surge in sales after that? Um. Uh, well, you know, I'll I'll be honest with you, like Miguel's. Uh, videos you know it just i i have you know great looking animals and he has this you know you see how his social media is you know and yeah. his personality it just went hand in hand together you know just to give him some frogs and get him you know something to make him happy basically that that's where i saw it as i just wanted to do something for him and let let him be happy with my frogs that, and that's where all i saw it as you know, like he, you know, like I, I just, uh, it was one of those things where it, it, meant, it was special for me to see him showcase my animals and right. I didn't expect anything out of it or nor, you know, did I see anything out of it or, you know, you, you bought frogs for me, right. you know, after seeing that video, but it was, it was more like, uh, uh that, uh, <laughs> from when he made that video, everything started getting better for me as far as, uh, uh, my my business growing and, and me uh, getting more of that drive and, and passion that I have for them to like keep moving forward for it. So right, I I saw more in it when he did it for me. Uh, did that video for me? It, it just sparked a little something else in me, you know, to want right. to keep moving forward. That, that's what I saw that, that happened for me. Okay, um, and and like, how much money are you dumping into this every month? versus how much money are you getting out i mean is it worth it for people to want to get into this hobby um well the the way i see it is if if you're gonna keep it as a hobby and you have the time to invest into it then like the money aspect should not uh really be a factor in it if you're trying to create something and 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 you want you know you you want to try to reproduce something that can make numbers like this you know so it's it's like how i, I tell everyone if if you don't you know if you don't like what you're doing as your job you know and you go in there every day and you put in your time and your hours 
and you still get paid, you know, at the end of the week, but you're not enjoying it. Like, does that mean something to you? Like, does that, does that solidify that you're doing well that, you know, that I, I the way I, I see it is what I'm putting in and the money and the time that I'm putting in is to like a, a bigger picture that's not going to just show up right away. You know? Right. And I can get there in a quicker amount of time than I can when I was breeding the snakes or getting involved in any other animal wildlife when I was doing different shows and, uh, you know, working with the wildlife and doing tours and stuff at the different facilities that I worked with. Like, uh, it's you're trying to nickel and dime here, there, and to try to get a big, you know, one big pile. And uh, what I'm doing right now, I'm, I'm putting in heavy to, uh, to with, with time and with the money every week to feed these animals. And then, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make it so that it's, it's going to come back with me in a good amount, you know, it's, it's right. going to make it worth it. It's, it's to me, it's, it's different, you know, because I have so many projects that I don't post or don't show right now that I'm working on that take time and money that you don't, you're not going to see back for a few years, you know, at any given time. So it's just, I try to now bring in different uh, species in, into my arsenal so that, you know, I'm as I'm feeding other species, these are reproducing quicker and I'm getting flow of money in, you know, uh, when I go to shows, you know, I, I do really well, man. And uh, it's uh, it, it gives me more of an opportunity to show what, what I'm doing because you can see the animals health in person. You know, you can see the quality of my setups that, that I put the animals in. So it's like, uh, Right now, it's more of a, a been an investing and reinvesting and, and reinvesting in, in it, and uh, and the most of cost of it is time, because right, right. There's you, you know if you were to pay yourself for the amount of time that you put into this, you know, there's it's not a <laughs> it's not it's not very profitable in in that sense, you know, like until you really have a good flow of uh, of, of offspring coming out and and the sales coming in. So right now, it's like time of the year where you know like i'm putting all my chips in and and putting everything together and uh and just getting bringing out the numbers you know and, and see how it goes goes from here but but when you're getting a thousand tadpoles at a time i i mean aren't you putting out the numbers already uh to me that's like you know those are rookie numbers you know like i'm trying to trying to get into the bulk aspect of them i'm trying to Trying to bring in, you know, you know, 10, 15,000 frogs, you know, easily, you know, within the first few months now. So it's like, oh, no kidding. Okay. And, yeah. and they sell that quick, huh? Well, yeah, man. So I, I'm an importer and exporter now. So I, I could ship you any day of the week, you know, frog right. from, instead of frogs here to Germany, to, you know, to Hong Kong, to Taiwan. So it's like, you know, whenever I need, uh, whenever I have the availability, it's going right. to be on. Gotcha. Okay. Well, and talk to me about your social media because I've noticed a lot in the last probably six months or so that I've been seeing posts and reels by you every day. Uh, are, are you purposely uh, like, are you filming a bunch of reels at once and then just scheduling them or what are you doing uh, with that? Everything's just live. Like just, oh. I, I'm in the moment, take a picture. I want to make a video, you know, make a reel. Uh, as soon as I got to a certain amount of followers, uh, Instagram and Facebook started monetizing me. So they, you know, they just through uh, putting out reels and, and uh, getting comments and shares and stuff like, you know, like the money has been coming in, you know, like they, it's pretty cool to, to see that kind of growth and see, you know, just off taking, you know, just showing some of my animals that, uh, right. you know, making some content that uh, some money can come back in and, and honestly, like, it's more like it's free advertising for me. Right. You know, if yeah. what does it cost me to just take a picture and, and make a post, you know, and show what, you know, some of the cool stuff that I'm working on that day or, you know, something that, that didn't look the same as it was when it was a baby and give a little update on it, you know, like, right. it, it's more, it's, it's just to keep a, a lot of, you know, my followers and a lot of my uh, comrades in this, you know, like just keep everyone, uh, energized and uh, and you know like keep the, that that uh that wanting to see what's next you know like that's basically why i do it man like the, the thrill of, of seeing what's new to come out every season 
Right. Well, and we were talking before we started, uh, before I hit the record button, and uh, you know, you don't even own a fucking computer, man. You, <laughs> you do all this shit. You run your fucking business on your phone, correct? Bro, this is technology, man. The apps that, that I currently run for my website and email and everything is just handheld right now. And, you know, it's... I work around it, man. Make my labels, everything <laughs> through Redline shipping right through my phone, you know. So it's, I can print it right through my phone, you know. Like it's a, it's just, it's just keeping it simple, you know. I, I definitely, as I'm growing now, I, I have a lot more to keep tabs on and stuff, and yeah. I want to uh, update my website and keep things, you know, uh, more in order uh, as it's growing. But yeah, it's just right now, my. My main focus is producing the animals, and like I'm, I'm really trying to focus on making new, new, new and exciting stuff to me. You know, like right. keep me in it. Well, and do you do everything yourself? Like, did you do your own website? Did you do, uh, you know, as far as for my website, um, a friend of mine that uh, got into white tree frogs, and she actually spawned her her first uh, frogs. I think it was last season or the year before she uh she was able to uh she made my website she put the time in and and saw that what what i was capable in, and she made a little investment in me uh and and made and you know i made that website for me to, to help me grow you know when right. when she when she made that website for me to, uh, that's when things got a little serious more serious on my my end with uh with, with sales and being uh out there as far as uh you know my business and do you sell on morph market or just through your uh, website through my website, uh, through uh, you know, mess email, I get a lot of email in- inquiries, and I just deal with that and and uh, fauna classifieds and, and then morph market as well. You know, really, I, oh, fauna, yeah. fauna classifieds, man. I haven't fucking even uh, been I on that. King, I would say kingsnake.com, but uh, you know, a lot of these YouTubers and and you guys here might not know what I'm talking about, so. It's, <laughs> you know. I know what King Snake. See, when I first saw you. I was like, this motherfucker is 15 years old, man. Like, like, how the fuck is he doing all this cool ass shit? But you're head. not, right? You're you're almost 40, right? Just turned 39. 39. Fucking 39, man. Fucking insane. So you remember the days of King Snake and you remember the days of Fauna. And and like you know, like you said before, you were dealing with a lot of old school people, yeah. you, you know, even back then. So that's so much more than what these newer ball python people have. You, you know, or they don't even know what King Snake was. They couldn't even imagine listing an animal and then coming back in three hours and that that number one animal is number three hundred and eighty seven fucking after three hours and you had to relist it again. You, you know, the first thing in the morning on the next day. Yeah, so, sure. man, yeah. it was a different. It was a different time. A different. You know, man, like that, the hobby during that time was awesome. You know, like it, it, everyone was focused on, you know, like trying to create and, and make new stuff. And, you know, it, it was there. I felt like that was a time when everyone had more of a love for the for breeding and, and, and creating new stuff. than uh, right. Then, then, you know, the, now things I, I just, you know, everyone has a how to make this video, you know, like how to breed this video. Like it's uh, I, I felt like it was more like um, during that time, like, you know, everyone just we they showed their work through their animals, traveling right. to the shows and uh, and getting that fan base and getting the, that clientele base by putting in the work, to, you know, showing uh, showing it through your animals. You know, right. Like, right. And that's, that's well, kind of the way I my formula of doing things. Well, there's something else I noticed about you. What nationality are you? I'm uh, Argentinian and half Cuban. Okay. Oh, I'm Cuban too. Uh, so, um, That's but cool. you I are, the, yeah, I know. I don't, I don't look it right. Cuban, <laughs> German, and Italian. Um, you're the first Argentinian Cuban that I've ever met named <laughs> Spencer. Okay. <laughs> Like, like, why did your parents give you just a basic white guy name? Well, from uh, what I heard as a kid growing up, my my father, uh, he was, you know, heavy into uh, the motorcycle scene and uh, car racing and, you know, and the, and the rock star lifestyle. And uh, he named me after a, a guy in the 80s named Freddie Spencer. 
that yeah. uh, raced for Honda and, yep. and the motorcycles. So that's that was the name he wanted to give me, but my mom didn't want Freddie. Right. So they named me Spencer. <laughs> and, I, and I believe the option that uh, my mom gave my dad was Oliver. So, yeah, my, my dad yeah. said no. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, no. Spencer's definitely better than Oliver. I'll definitely yeah. give you that. Fuck it. Now, Imagine now, growing up in a Cuban world, man, in a Hispanic <laughs> world named Spencer, dude. I, they couldn't, they couldn't get my name until I was maybe in high school. You know, right. they, they had no idea what where, where I was from, what I, you know, why I looked this way and was named this way. Like they, they had no idea. Maybe I was a doctor. That's, that's fucking great, man. That's fucking funny as shit. What What's the five year plan, man? Five year plan, yeah. Where, where I see myself in five years, yeah. yeah. Of uh, man, you know, honestly, I, I, I see myself as, as far as in, in breeding and, and keeping a like just a, a variety of species that is not not just in the in the reptile and amphibian world. Like uh, there's there's like I, I definitely want to get into breeding different uh, like aquarium fish. Like, right. Uh, there's, there's the saltwater and freshwater, you know, like uh, breeding that's getting very big. And I kind of wanted to get into something that was a little more challenging on, on my end. So I, I, I see myself, you know, I want, once I get figure out and, and get more of the, the other species of uh, amphibians that I have right now into the market, then I'm going to start, you know, trying to breed some fish. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, and you just, uh, you just, not really open the place, but you're currently building yeah, a new we're building out everything, getting everything set up now. Uh, once it, once the the I get a bunch of these spawns out and and have time now, then my next steps is gonna be building it out and just uh, expanding, just uh, growing out more uh, more animals and uh, and trying to you know uh, get some help in and uh, and and show really what you know what, what I'm capable of. You know, I, I feel like this is just a small sample of what uh, I'm able to uh, to showcase and, uh, and and produce. So, you know, I, I really have a a lot a lot more to show in the next five years. That, that's for sure. And, and what's the square footage of the new place? I, we're gonna be working with about twenty five hundred square feet. Twenty five, yeah. fucking that's big. Yeah. And do you have it filled up yet, or do you have uh, enough to fill it? Oh no, yeah, it's it's that's in the process, man. Just that's that's why I'm gonna be, uh, you know, trying to plan it out and uh, and see what uh, where I, what I want to move into after this season, because yeah. I, I see how the market is going with uh, certain species and and uh, certain reptile laws changing, and uh, I just I see that uh, keeping such uh, like bigger animals and stuff is uh, for me is not not too smart as far as like space wise, you know. So, right. Like, I, there's a lot of other species that that I want to work with that like the different life uh, cycle uh, stages for them. It, right, it's gonna take more space than what I currently have with the, with the animals that I'm working with. So right. uh, yeah, I'm trying to just plan it all right and uh, just keep everything alive, man. And you know, take it one day at a time, man. Because it really it's like a, you know every three hours I'm uh, changing water or feeding right now. So it's a <laughs> You know, it's an all day long process right now. That I yeah, have. yeah, and every time I see, you know, tanks of your, I mean, everything, the water is just crystal clear, and fucking, it's like there's always some kind of either draining water or filling up water noises in the back. Uh, it, it's just, I, yeah, I can't even imagine the fucking work that you do to maintain it. Yeah. Um, now, how could people get in touch with you if they want to get in touch with you? Um, well, uh, my for social media, um, I'm on Facebook and Instagram, and it's at a tree a tree frog collective is my my social media handle and uh, my website. You know, it's uh, www.treefrogcollective.com. Uh, it has uh, you know some available uh, animals right now, but uh, in the next few weeks, uh, with what I've been producing last season and this season, I'm gonna start making more now things available. It's just uh, I've. I, I was uh, out of my house for about you know three four months through the construction and uh, then that's when you know winter hits so everything kind of uh, kind of cooled down and uh, slowed down uh, on its own and, and naturally and now like this next you know couple of months I'm able to uh, start popping new things and it's just uh, you know as the as the warm the warmer months start popping out that's when uh, things start cooking over here so cool fucking well everybody. 
a tree frog collective.com. No, tree frog collective.com, right? Yes, yes, sir. And a tree frog collective everywhere else. Spencer, thank you for fucking taking the time, man. I, oh, I look man. forward to working with you in the future. I, you know, I, I'll be honest, man. Like, I, I enjoy a lot of podcasts like uh, that are not reptile related, but as far as for reptiles, man, I, I'm always in <laughs> right, right when you got it's something new, man. I, I really dig what, what, what you got going on, man. And, uh, I really appreciate man, the opportunity to be here. Thank you, man. No, I, I appreciate you even fucking coming on. And oh, uh, man, you you the frogs. First. Excuse me? Yeah, no. yeah, it's the first frog fucking podcast uh, I've ever done. So, that's awesome. dude, thank you so much, man. Um, this is going to come out, well, day after tomorrow. So, fucking, uh, hopefully, you, you know, I'm not saying it'll give a bigger push than Miguel, but fucking hopefully we're we're right up there with them. No, man, because, you, uh, what you guys have to understand is that anything, like any of the content, it was just the support from you guys, it means it means a lot to me. And it just gives me that, that drive to want to do more. So thank you, man. Thank you I'm for gonna take some, I'm going to take some more pictures of these fucking fat bastards again and tag you with them this week, man. I, so I, I fucking love it. it. Brother, thank, thank you so much, man. Thank you, man. Have a good one. You All too, right. man. Bye-bye. Thank you. Geeky Geckos is Arizona's largest gecko breeder, and they're helping usher the fat man into the uh, leopard gecko space. They have a really popular YouTube channel for education, care, and breeding, and all that other fun shit. And they have an active community on Instagram, Facebook, and, uh, and Discord over at, uh, at Geeky Gecko Creations. Oh. Since they're in Arizona and it's fucking 98 degrees there in the winter, they could ship year round. Plus, if you buy from them, they basically have free consultations about your collection for life. That's forever, forever and ever. Call or text Frank today at 480-299-7657 with any questions or inquiries that you have. That's a fucking man that stands by his shit that he's willing to give out his fucking cell number to all of you degenerates. There's another Snakes and a Fat Man special with Geeky Gecko Creations. It's hard to fucking say. Um, <laughs> there's a special 10% discount on all applicable animals using code SATFM10 at checkout. Go check out Frank and his awesome fucking animals at Geeky GeckoCreations.com. I fucking love Spencer. I want to thank him again for coming on the show and hanging out with me. And guys, if you had a great time this episode, fucking, and if you want more of it, join the old uh, Patreon family like all these fucking cool motherfuckers right here at Patreon.com slash Snakes and the Fat Man. You'll get exclusive video. You'll get discounts on merchandise. Uh, just a bunch of fun shit, man. And what you don't get is no fucking toxic Discord. Don't even bother with it. Fuck it. Discord fucking breeds toxicity. Did I say that right? Toxicity. Yeah, fuck, fuck Discord, all right? Uh, let's just fucking have fun. Let's fucking laugh a little. Patreon.com slash Snakes and the Fat Man. Head on over. Fucking see what's up. You know what time it is. Congrats to the winner of the Stop Looking and Sounding Like Shit giveaway. I'll be in contact with you, and uh, we will ship out your stuff via Redline Shipping uh, pro probably this week if I get a chance to uh, head on over to the post office. I, I hope you take it and look better and sound better on any podcast that you show up on. See, I just got a message there. Sorry about that. Uh, I don't know why. Fucking for somebody that's so hated, I get messaged a lot. There's only one Zoom call a month now. Uh, it's normally the last Sunday of every month at 8 o'clock. So I'm not sure what the date is, but uh, the last Sunday of March, we will have another fun and exciting Zoom call. It's always funny. It's always free. And it's never recorded. And I invite some of the douchebags that actually hate me to come to the Zoom call. Fucking let's talk it out, man. Maybe we could become friends. <laughs> I mean, weirder things have fucking happened. Anyway, open invite. Any of the haters want to come, just 
message me and I'll fucking give you the link and we could hash it out there, right in public. Again, that's the last Sunday of this month. I hope to see a lot of you guys there. And don't forget to tune in right here, Snakes and the Fat Man channel, for Fat Man Live this Sunday. I believe that's, uh, let's see, it's Sunday the 19th. I'm going to have the stunning Tommy Gill on from Inky Clouds Ball Pythons. This woman has been in the fucking hobby for years, and she's so fucking knowledgeable. And all of you Ball Python people should tune in and listen to her. I don't even know if we're going to talk about ball pythons, uh, but fuck it. She's a smart fucking woman who's a fucking hell of a lot of fun to talk to. So uh, this Sunday, March 19th, Fat Man Live, Tommy Gill, Inky Clouds, Ball Pythons. Finally, catch a new episode of Bronx Down Under on Tuesday, March 21st. It's going to be a great time, and Brian, Luke, and I would like to thank the ton of people that showed up and made the first episode such a fucking success. I mean, we really are having a great time with this. On this next episode, there's not gonna be reptile talk. It's gonna be about the etymology of words. And Brian is doing all the research, so it should be a little bit better this time. If you get a minute, go subscribe to me on YouTube, follow me on Instagram, friend me on Facebook, let's talk, all right? Maybe I'm not the asshole that you think I am. Thank you for hanging around for the whole episode again. And hopefully, I'll see you guys in two weeks, if not sooner, on all the other shows that we're doing. Thank you. I fucking love the people who have been watching and listening for seven goddamn years. I appreciate you guys more than I could fucking tell you. Have a good one. Everyone talks their own shit about what kind of racks you should buy. Metal racks are great, but everyone doesn't want a goddamn seven foot high, six foot wide, 2,000 pound metal rack in their fucking house. That's a two refrigerator footprint, man. Two fucking refrigerators. Sea Serpents makes insane quality racks that could fit anywhere. They're stackable PVC racks that are living room friendly, and they're shipped fully assembled with heat tape already installed. Just plug it into a thermostat and you're ready to go. When we had the shop, we had over 20 sea serpent racks there before they ever became a sponsor of uh, Snakes and a Fat Man. I don't breed much anymore these days, but I still have a few racks here in my house, and you could be goddamn sure that they're sea serpents. Oh, and they also make hot box incubators, probably the best reptile incubators made in America. At the height of our breeding business, we had four four-foot hot box incubators, and again, I still have a small hotbox incubator here in case anything I keep actually does breed. Go to SeaSerpents.com and check out their incredible selection of PVC racks and tell Chris Nettles that the Fat Man sent you.